All right. I, uh, now that I see uh, both regulatory agency and the uh, regulated uh, uh, community is represented, both of you are represented here, I know that both the regulated community and the regulatory agency have a tendency to focus on the bottom line, productivity, uh, time co cost savings, time savings, and that is the reason why we developed this class. I think both sides can benefit to what we're going to talk about because we would like to give you some reasons to save on time. Because I know that uh, business owners, especially Walmart, who are um, oh, clean harbors, and clean harbors too, I met just two of them. Uh, I will meet most of you by the end of this class. But all these business owners and operators, they, they are like focused on productivity, right? And profitability, right? I think so, right? You should be, I mean, you're businesses, right? But every day, you kept going on uh, your daily business, and then all of a sudden, a Cooper inspector comes in, and he will take, or he or she will take away from your focus, right? So we are here to make sure that that focus is not diminished. So I think both sides, the regulatory agency, and the regulated community can benefit from this class. Top 10 reasons why industry should attend this class. When I was developing this topic, I said, no, I actually asked myself, Jojo, do you think you can do justice for this topic if you do it alone? I answered myself. I said, no, Jojo, you cannot do it. <laughs> so, Thank you for laughing. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, I said, no, Jojo, you cannot do it on your own. So I asked the more junior members of our division, Paolo Zenorosa and Raquel Doom, to join me for this talk. Did we mention he's our boss? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so they have no say whatsoever on what I do. Anyhow, um, they represent the fresh, young perspective of a Cooper inspection. I represent the old and decrepit. <laughs> because I have been working for, for Los Angeles County Cooper for like 23 years. But I started when I was 12. <laughs> that still says. <laughs> no, I said that so many times already. And yes, ma'am, I'm only 35 years old. And your name is? Shelby. Shelby, you represent? Um, I'm an attorney representing retail establishment. Retail establishment. So you, you represent Walmart? Meet an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, because she was like thinking, 23 plus 12, yes, I am 35 years old. I only look this old because of stress from my boss. No, that's not my boss. Actually, you see, my opening act doesn't work. Oh, my boss, right there. <laughs> you missed it, okay, I will have to repeat. I am so sorry, she missed it. I danced her and everything. You see, I danced her, and then she didn't come. I mean, all right, okay, let me repeat, all right? So. Uh, as I was saying, Karen, <laughs> she missed it. So I, I have to repeat it. I mean, I have it in my head. I mean, I have to say it. So I said, I have been working for Los Angeles County Cooper for 23 years, and this woman here is puzzled. <laughs> and I told her that I started when I was 12. And I told her, yes, what's your name again? Shelby, Shelby. Shelby, meet Kelly. <laughs> She's an attorney representing retail stores. Walmart is a big retail store. Anyhow, I told her I was only 35 years old. And then I told her I only look this old because of stress from my boss. <laughs> and, I, and I was gonna say, whoops. You see, this is the opening act. This is the op entire opening act and she ruined it. But anyhow, <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, so I, I, cause, and I pointed to Walter. He was my previous boss, but but not anymore, but the current boss is the one who actually caused me some stress. <laughs> so, it's a stress from my boss and I would say, whoops, she's here. Did I say that loud? 
You see, it didn't work now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, actually, I look this old because of stress from my wife. <laughs> wait, 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 is she here? It's being videotaped. <laughs> is she here? Oh, no, 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 I'll stick with that. I, it's stress from my wife. But enough about my stress, let's start with the top 10 reasons why industry should attend this class, and Paul is gonna take it away. <coughs> Thank you, Jojo. <coughs> and just to start, before we go to the tips, I just wanted to present you guys with, uh, with this inspector's roadmap. This is pretty much most, what most facilities will encounter when an inspector, Coupa inspector comes. And it's pretty simple, you know, it's first contact, that's when uh, uh, the inspector comes in, introduces himself, uh, review documents when he comes in and, and goes through your paperwork, walk through is one, th you know, walk through. And in closing conference, that's when you uh, review the report, ask any questions and clarify things. But I think this is important to look at before we go to the test because um, some of the tips may apply to s just specific portions of this roadmap, and some of them might be more ap ap applicable to the whole thing. Okay, so um, first let me just start out by saying that a lot of these tips are obvious. Um, face it, they're downright common sense, but uh, we still see a lot of these uh, things missing out there by operators, so we felt it was necessary to put in the presentation. Um, before we start, at the bottom of each helpful tip screen, we put a time value. And we just put that there because we think that'll represent the amount of time saved if you follow that tip. My but that is arbitrary, okay? <laughs> it's, like, it's not like, I mean, if you are a big box store like Walmart, it will save you that Actually, Walmart is a pretty easy inspection, but if you're, a, who represents plating facility here? A plating facility, nobody from plating facility here? Ah, no. we got one? <laughs> Where, where's the plating facility? Oh, great, there you go. What is your name, sir? Let me advertise your company. Um, oops. Edward from Triumph Fab Fabricators. Edward, Edward from, if, if it's a plating facility, most likely, it will take a junior inspector, like five days, and a, an old inspector, one hour. Oh no, I'm just kidding, no, 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 I'm just kidding, no, 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 that's not it. But what I'm saying is, these numbers are arbitrary, sometimes it depends on how big your company is, okay? A few of the numbers might be a tiny bit exaggerated, but uh, nevertheless, okay, so we can advance. Our first tip, designate an environmental health and safety manager. So that's pretty basic, right? We, uh, we wanted to come up with a title for the purposes of this presentation that would just encompass all of the duties and responsibilities uh, that go with having uh, a COOPA permit. So, so we're gonna call this person an environmental health and safety manager. By no means are we saying, you know, this has to be a payroll title. Um, oftentimes the duty kind of falls on the person with the, the highest rank at the time, and that's fine, but what we really want is we want the person to be on site, and we want them to understand everything that, that's expected of them and that we're gonna require. So that's, that's probably uh, the most important thing there. <clears throat> um, we want these people to understand, first of all, that they have a permit, we want them to know what the permit is for, and we want them to understand they're gonna be inspected for the permit. Um, I, just last week, I conducted an inspection at, uh, what was this, uh, Walmart? Uh, transport, no, no, was no, it? not Walmart. No, not, not anyone here. It was a transportation yard, so fairly large. They had probably about 500,000 trailers. And uh, I walked in, told the receptionist who I was, and. The, the person that the previous inspector had met with was no longer working at the facility. So uh, she gave me the, the yard manager, and I told him again who I was, why I was there, and he said, oh, we, we don't have a, a COOPA permit. Actually, I didn't even try and tell him what COOPA meant. I just said hazmat permit. No, we don't have a hazmat permit. He said, okay, I'm looking at my computer screen, and the count is active, so somebody paid it. Someone thought that they needed a permit, so. I said, okay, I, I had some notes saying that they had a couple of ASTs, and I asked him, do you, you still have the, the diesel, the 1,000 gallon above ground diesel tank? 
He said, oh yeah, we have diesel, but we don't have any hazardous materials. <laughs> like, okay, I put my bag down. I thought it was going to be a while before I'm invited to the opening conference. So um, again, you know, he's a person on site. I think his boss kind of floats between a few yards, and so he's not always there. And you want somebody on site that knows about the permit, knows what we're going to do, um, and that's, that's likely to be there when we show up. So that's just the first, uh, the first uh, part of that. Um, we also, uh, actually we can probably advance that. Sometimes uh, the person just is the owner. This is just a small mom and pop printing shop. And so sometimes the person is the owner. If they have to delegate the duties and responsibilities to other employees, that's fine. Again, we just want someone to take responsibility, someone to understand what's required. <clears throat> um, could probably go on to the next. We want this person to inform everyone that they are the person to contact when an inspector's on site. They're the person that knows about hazardous materials and hazardous waste. We want them to inform all of their employees. We want them to update SIRS. Sometimes that happens, sometimes that doesn't. But um, it's, you know, we'll look there to find a contact name. But if, if it's not in SIRS, I mean, at least let your employees know. Especially, you know, a lot of you guys have, um, well, some of the, the industry, I know there's a lot of box stores here, but some of the other uh, processing plants have security gates, and they hire third-party firms and those guards kind of change maybe every six months or so. And so let them know. Just, you know, even if you have a sheet of paper at the guard shack that says, when an inspector comes on site, call me. Because a few times, the, you know, the guard calls the operator or the receptionist, and they were calling two friends, and the guard is helpful, and he's trying to call two friends. And, you know, a lot of times is, is wasted with your employees trying to figure out who I should be talking to. So that's... Uh, that's our helpful tip number one. Which reminds me, I actually come from private industry, so let's count. 23 years in LA County, but I, I worked for private industry for five years. 23 plus five. But I started when I was 12, <laughs> so that means I'm 40 years old. So when I, start, when I was at private industry, I actually wore several hats. Who wears several hats at their company here? You see so many, right? You, uh, when, when I was in private industry, I was in charge of quality control. My, my title was staff engineer. So I was in charge of quality control, and I was a government regulatory agency liaison, and I am an environmental kind of guy uh, who takes care of the wastewater and waste uh, treatment system. Thank goodness they're out of business now so that, <laughs> so that we don't have to inspect them. Uh, but. Individuals can actually wear several hats, but make sure that you actually designate somebody who's in charge of EHS. Because if you don't, then it will actually waste a lot of your time trying to find out who to, uh, to escort the Koopa inspector. All right? <clears throat> okay, well, tip number two before I go on, I just wanted to do a quick survey. Who here kind of acts like an environmental health safety manager for their company? Just to raise your hands. That's that's. Now, those of you who did not raise your hands, why are you here? I'm so sorry. No, no. welcome. <laughs> and, and the reason I ask, um, I think this this next tip would be equally important, or maybe even more important, at certain occasions, than just having an environmental health and safety manager. May. <clears throat> And you know that's because you know uh, Cooper inspectors sometimes they just inspect your uh, inspect your facility in uh, four ways, right? When either you're yeah, we only come by <laughs> four times during the year. When you're either on vacation, out sick, traveling to another state at another facility, or you just retired. That's pretty much the only time we show up. So. But there are a lot of people here are so young looking. So you're not going to retire in 10 years, correct? You're not. You're not. And you're not going to retire in 50 years, right? <laughs> 50 years. So no retirement on all people around here, correct? What about you, Shelby? No retirement for you. Right. Not in th 30 years, right? <laughs> and, and as an EHS uh, manager, you're kind of like a primary containment. You know, inspectors always say, what's your secondary containment? So what's your secondary containment? And that's easy. Just designate an assistant assistant ESS manager. 
And uh, we think it's important to kind of stress this because we do encounter a lot of facilities that where the EHS manager was re retired on vacation out sick. And um, I, <coughs> there's a lot of things that you could do with an assistant. Um, it'd be used for succession planning as a backup. Um, if your company's expanding, opening another shop, another location, this person can just transition, become the EHS manager for that location. <coughs> um, and it's, there's a few ways we think we could set this up. And the easiest way is just having an EHS manager and assistant on one location. Bonus tip. Uh, we have a bonus tip for you. OK, if any of your facilities are locations where filming is frequently done, you have to let us know. You have to let the COOPA inspector know. Why? It has absolutely nothing to do with your permit. We just like that stuff. Yes. Just want to know. I am easily starstruck. Yeah. Walmart. Who are your like commercial models for? I don't know of any commercial models for Walmart, right? Um, Mr. Rollback. Mr. Rollback. Oh no, not, not famous <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, I mean, I remember, I remember, I responded to, to an incident, uh, in an alley that time forgot, somewhere in L.A. And it's a big building, and there was a, an oil spill in the alley. And I talked to the property owner and so on and so forth. And, and, and they told me, just like what she said, when there's a filming going on, they usually let you know. So, so they told me that that building actually was used for a Rihanna music video. And all of a sudden, I just like got starstruck. When is the next filming? And then he told me, uh, you have to give, give me your email address. And, and things like that. And then uh, I did not give them an NOV anymore. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 that's not true. I still ask them to clean it up, all right? All right, so anyway, I was, just a couple weeks ago, I was watching the new series Marvel's, Marvel's Agent Carter. It's the Captain America spinoff. And I recognized this scene as taking place uh, in a power plant in Redondo Beach that Paolo and I actually Inspected, yeah. <laughs> we actually no inspected it. <laughs> oh, really? Too much health and safety. Oh, it's too bad. Oh, but oh. and we were informed actually when we were there that they that this area, this uh, very old section of the plant that's no longer used, um, it is a is a frequent site of filming. So you know, we took a couple pictures. It can go on. Now, who's that handsome guy in the middle? <laughs> Why you follow? <laughs> I didn't recognize him with a hard hat. Uh, and there he is with the environmental health and safety manager and the assistant environmental health and safety manager. And again, when we did, when we when uh, when I was planning this inspection, I asked Raquel to, to do a joint with me because you know as a junior inspector, two junior inspectors <laughs> may equal a senior. Yes, yes. <laughs> so anyway, this is no. It makes five. Five. It takes five junior inspectors. <laughs> to make a senior <laughs> an old decrepit <laughs> So this is me, uh, Rachel's, uh, Raquel's taking a picture. Uh, that's Tracy, and that's Jim on my right, on my left. Um, anyway, the point of this is when, when we went to this facility, um, it's a pretty huge facility, something that took pretty much the whole day to do. Uh, walking through, during the walkthrough, um, we'd see different things, maybe we'll have questions for either one of them. And when Tracy's leading the, the tour, would ask him questions, and if he doesn't know the answer, he'd give a call to his one, his, one of his staff. And then while he's occupied with that, uh, Jim would take over and continue the tour. That way, no time is wasted. <coughs> and another way to set it up, if you'd like, uh, from our experience, um, uh, if, if your facility is so big, it's like a campus, like a hospital, for example. It doesn't have to be just one. EHS manager and an assistant it can be one EHS manager overseeing the whole campus, and then several assistants, either one in the pharmacy, one doing the uh, uh, compressed gas cylinders, one in the lab. Uh, that's just another way to set it up. Okay. But wait, remember what I talked to you about somebody wearing several hats? Now let me ask you, can one person wear the hat of an environmental health and safety manager, and the same person do the assistant environmental health and safety manager. What is your answer, sir? No. And your name is? David. David. Yeah. From what company, sir? U-Haul International. U-Haul. Thank goodness I'm not moving anymore. I'm, I'm, 
in my lifetime here in America, I am immigrated from the Philippines, right? Why am I telling you this? Because I want to. Uh, <laughs> but I moved, I moved like nine times already, right? And so I said, I told my wife, that's it, we're not moving anymore. But of course, I'm sure it will change. But anyhow, uh, he said no. Why do you think an EHS manager cannot be the same person as an assistant EHS manager? Correct, and you are Adeline. Ad Adeline? Yeah, from Grimway Farms. From what? Grimway Farms. Greenway Farms. Grimway. Farms. Grimway. Yeah. Grimway Farms. Carrots. Carrots. Yeah. Carrots. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Oops. Sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny. Uh, now I lost my. Mind. Okay. Uh, Grimway Farms. Oh, I, I, I. Those are your baby carrots. Oh. We buy it at Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because they're cheap at Walmart. No, cheap is not the word inexpensive. Okay? No, you cannot have the same person as the EHS manager and the assistant EHS manager because it defeats the purpose. Meaning, even if you are a one man shop, designate your wife to be the assistant. You be the owner, operator, and several other hats, but there must be an assistant that is not you. So that when a Cooper inspector comes in and you're not there, then there is an assistant. Because if you are, I mean, wearing several hats, but then you wear the same thing, and then it defeats the purpose, right, of tip number two. So um, make sure that even if you are a one-man shop, who represents here a smaller company, like uh, less than 10 employees? Nobody. Oh, yes? Yes. You have less than 10, 10 employees, right, sir? And your name is? <laughs> Steve, Steve, so for example, you are the EHS manager, and you are the owner, operator, you're the president, you are the chief financial officer, but you cannot be the assistant EHS manager. You must designate somebody else in case you're not there, right? Even if you're, if, even if you're only a one-man shop, as I said, designate your son, your attorney, uh, your attorney, no, no, not attorneys, no. <laughs> Someone on site. Right. Not, not the attorney because the attorney gets paid too much. Right, Shelby? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> now you. Now you All right. All right. Help with tip number three. All right. Number three. Okay. So we think uh, this tip will save you about 60 minutes. And we say, why not eliminate surprises? Can go on. Conduct mock audits. Now this, I'm always amazed because again, common sense, you think, you know, I walk around my facility, but don't just walk around because you're getting from point A to point B and you kind of take a glance, at, you know, at a few things. Walk around with intent, at least, you know, I, I would say in the beginning once a month, um, but you know, it's gonna be up to you. You're gonna have to just determine whether or not you need more mock audits. Definitely don't wait more than six months to do it, but walk around open all the doors, ask your employees questions, that's what I'm gonna do when I come there. If I'm at a box store and you say, all my employees are trained to, to clean up spills and, um, and take care of that hazardous waste, then okay, if I walk through the facility, you know, through the store and I see one of your employees, I'm gonna ask, them. I mean, just ask them, what would you do if Drano was, you know, spilled on your household uh, chemical aisle? And I want to know. I want to know if that person is, in fact, trained and, and what they would do if they're following procedures. They're kind of fumbling. They don't know. Because I'm not there when, you know, I'm, I'm going to walk through. I'm going to want to see that aisle. But there may not be anything going on. There may not be any uh, uh, material leaking. So I can't observe how they're going to take care of it. So I'm going to ask your employees questions. And I think that you guys should do that, too. It, it really does help. And it gets them um, prepared to answer questions. You know, sometimes they see an inspector and, and, and we go up and ask questions and they get very nervous, you know, and, and they kind of fumble and, and it's okay, but if, maybe if you just kind of uh, role play with them a little bit, that would help out. Um, let's see here. Also, uh, a bigger facility, um, I might ask, uh, say, a chemical blender, uh, you know, how do you, you know, uh, somebody who's actually in charge of, of putting product from a blending tank into a drum. How do you do that? You know, I'm going to ask the employee, because he may not be drumming anything off when I'm there. 
I want to know, are you using safe practices? Is he, you know, saying that he's got all these procedures, he uses drip pans and absorbent pads, or is he simply disconnecting the hose and the whole procedure is just let the whatever products in the hose run on the ground and, oh, we hose it and falls into the trench and, you know, now I'm thinking, oh, gosh, now they're using the trench as a holding tank and, and that's a whole other set of issues. So, again, just walk through the facility, ask your employees questions. Uh, oh yeah, the next one. So it, it's kind of hard to see here, but here's a facility I, wa I uh, inspected. It's a decent sized automotive repair shop. The owner happened to be there uh, when I arrived, so he took me around. His hazardous waste storage area is located, you know, behind a locked gate. You have to go through a building, through a locked door. So you can't see it unless you go back there. And when we walked back there, this is only one small section of it, but this is what we saw. And it's, you know, tilted drums with oil dripping onto oil-saturated cardboard. They're open, they've got makeshift funnels. You know, they're, they're kind of blocked. There's drums behind drums. Uh, there's a lot of storage back there, the boat, number one. Uh, just a lot going on, and, and his mouth kind of dropped, and he goes, I haven't been back here in over a year. Oh. They, oh. Okay, well, he said, yeah, I turned this over to my son, and I thought he was doing the job. But obviously nobody was conducting a mock audit. Had they done that, he would have caught this, and he would have avoided a lot of violations. Um, and again, who was the EH manager? Who was the health and safety manager? Who was the assistant? You know, was anybody actually knowledgeable about what they were required to, to do? This, this next uh, slide here, um, this is a paint, an auto body shop. That's a paint booth. Um, kind of sad, the owner, I think he had, prior to my inspection, he had a stroke um, and was in the hospital for like six months or a year or something. He, he just hadn't been on site. And I think his wife was trying to help out, you know, run the business. And there was an employee, I think he had a couple employees that were trying to, you know, just keep the business going. Um, there's a bit of a language barrier, but I asked the employee uh, if, you know, they still use the paint booth, um, you know, who, who changed the filters, and he, and he finally said that uh, they had a service, a third-party service, change the filters. So he said, okay, that's, you know, looks clean, I don't know. Then he said he didn't use it, but anyway, uh, looking in the trash cans, I see, and I don't know if you can see in the corner there, there's paint booth filters. So. You know, again, no one was trained, no one was really conducting mock audits because he really couldn't tell me anything about those filters, why they were there, if they're supposed to be there, what type of paint they use. I don't know if they're, you know, using primer that has metals in it, so you can't just dispose of that in the trash. Um, so he, you know, had to remove those and, and obviously, again, violations resulting. And it could have easily been avoided. <coughs> And uh, speaking about mock audits too, um, me and Raquel went and inspected the school district uh, somewhere in LA. And they're very good. They got a whole team of environmental health and safety people. Um, they conduct mock audits every year. And in this particular case, uh, when we do these inspections, we interview some of the teachers that handle hazways. And um, I asked one of the biology teachers, um, what do you do with uh, when you're done with the uh, the specimens, the biological specimens, the ones that's preserved with formal and formaldehyde. Anyway, long story short, he couldn't quite answer the way the, the EHS manager wanted. He answered truthfully, he just says he dumps it in the trash. Um, anyway, uh, the EHS manager and the whole team just told me that's just a training issue. We need to let him know, blah, blah, blah. But the whole point is, you know, just because you do mock audits and they, they catch a lot of these things, there's still a lot of room for improvement, such as increasing the frequency of your mock audits or just having somebody on site. Like in this case, uh, some of the school districts, they don't have anybody on site. They just have a, a headquarters for the EHS people. Which reminds me again of my private industry experience. When I was in private industry, and I don't think this side is being focused on so much, so I'm gonna be here. Uh, when I was in private industry, I, I was the, environmental health and safety guy for that private industry and I dread the day of our corporate mock audits. 
because they actually are more strict than any of the junior inspectors, not even the old decrepit inspectors, because they are really very strict, because they, they have to follow all the uh, SOPs and the policies and procedures and things like that, which are not even legally mandated for the company to, uh, to follow, right? So I remember mock audits by corporate, uh, corporate office to be really more strict. And at the same time, I also remember when, because I, 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 I worked for a glass manufacturing company way back. And they have a corporate office, I think in Texas somewhere. Uh, and then we also have a very big client, like a, like a multi-million dollar contract with another company, right, for, to, who supplies uh, all the, uh, you know, window frames, window uh, fixtures for all the buildings that they build, the co a construction company, right? So they also send auditors. So not just the corporate office, but also the clients send their auditors to make sure that we are doing the right thing because they have to have the supply of glass. They have to have their product so make to, to make sure that they, they run an, a safe operation, they're, they're not gonna be closed down, they're not gonna be red tagged on any pieces of equipment whatsoever, so they, they conduct all this mock audits. And this, these mock audits are very helpful. You think that is correct? Mock safety audits? What, what company do you represent, sir? Uh, Southern California Gas Company. <laughs> gas Company! Can you pay my bill? No. <laughs> It's the, it's the winter season. My bill is really high now because my wife is so cold-hearted. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no! Did you, did you take that? No! No, th that, that was not part of the opening act. But, no, she, she wants heat turned on all the time. I mean, she wants it 75 degrees. Come on, who puts that 75? But she does. She has cold feet all the time. So, Southern California Gas Company, he said that mock audits are very important to avoid these surprises that Raquel was talking about. Okay, number four. Um, this tip, again, it, it's with the, it used to be to, to, to reduce any surprises. And when you reduce any surprises, uh, you reduce any errors, and that kind of equates to self-identification and self-correction of any issues that you would find internally before any inspector come in. Now, this one, not so much as the mock audit, yeah, about 30 minutes, we, we, as, we estimate it can save. So this wants to develop a Q&A sheet. It's kind of like a, a frequently asked questions. I mean, when an inspector comes in to your facility, they're going to ask questions from, if you look at the, the, the inspector's roadmap earlier, first contact, walk through, document review, closing conference, they're going to be asking pretty much the same questions 90% of the time, depending on, your, on the industry in a situation, it might be a little different. But for the most part, a lot of these uh, questions will be s similar. So let's start with, um, let's kind of elaborate on this based on the, the road map. So the first contact. Um, this is kind of where the first impression happens when an inspector comes into your facility. And this is usually where the inspector comes and meets up with a reception desk or a security uh, guard station. And We'll mention some sample questions throughout this time, but by no means that they're only, the only question that they're going to be asking. This is just to start with. So we're usually going to ask you, where can I find a manager? I'm here to do a coupon inspection. Has there been a change in ownership? And I, I think at this point, it's kind of important to know if there's been a change in owner, because sometimes if there is a change in ownership, um, that changes everything. <laughs> yeah, the operation. We've got to change the permit. Yeah, the operation changes. There might be some permits that need to drop off. It just clears the whole air up. And what does your company do? So after first contact, they may go ahead and go uh, review your documents. Typical questions for a, a hazardous waste generator will be, who picks up your hazardous waste? You know, what company? <coughs> who signs for your manifest. I mean, for typically these questions, the uh, answers to these questions should be pretty straightforward. <coughs> what would you do in case of a spill? And what kind of has waste training? 
that you get. And these are just sample questions. I have nothing for tip number four. <laughs> so we'll, we'll when, I, when I was in private industry, we did not do this. So uh, That's I'm sorry, I'm guilty. No I did not do this. <laughs> That's not where they went out of business, was it? <laughs> <laughs> good one, Paolo, good one. I'm trying to be funny too, anyway. <clears throat> so after the review of documents, we'll, we'll show you a bunch of other pictures um, of, uh, of sample walkthroughs throughout the facil different facilities. And I want to maybe get your participation on it, see what, what you think an inspector might ask when they come and see this type of, <laughs> these type of images you're going to walk through. Um, now this one, this one is, we were, this is a uh, oil refinery at one of the locations that they call a boneyard where they keep all the scraps and stuff. Anybody know what an issue here could be, what possible question an inspector might ask if they see this? Where do you start? Yeah. <laughs> Why is the ground mushy? That is very good. <laughs> no, see, it's, it's very obvious. So um, if somebody knows what's in it, that's great. If somebody doesn't, that's going to be a problem. So in this particular case, uh, after further investigation, he found out that there was some leftover chemical residue in the barrels, and this kind of led into a a few grand, uh, administrative enforcement order. So it, it became very expensive. Money. Let's see, how about this one? Let's see. Another one of our handsome inspectors. And he's not here. He's supposed to attend today. <laughs> oh, that's right. Where yeah, where is he? Uh huh. So we're supposed to pick on it. So, anyway, anybody? This is, we're, we're, we were conducting an inspection at, um, on Catalina Island, and we saw this one, you know. Can anyone tell what that is? Yeah. I don't, it's kind of small. An underground tank. Yeah, <laughs> very good. <laughs> Creativity is going in your yeah. place, right? Yeah, we have very, yeah, very limited resources in Catalina, so that's yeah. So it, they it looks like they didn't bury it deep enough, but um, <laughs> <laughs> thank God. Thank Tip God. number. <laughs> <laughs> he scored. <laughs> Are we keeping points here? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> anyway, later investigation showed that this, this it, it is a drum, it's filled with water, and it, it, it serves as a blind sup for the secondary containment on the side for rainwater. So it, it turned out to be no issue. I, actually, let me add that um, if that drum was buried maybe three years ago, and the employees that were all around back then were, are no longer around, now you've got newbies there, so explain to them what that is because again when we come you guys are not going to be there you're on vacation or you're sick and and so that they know because otherwise we're red flags are going up and we're thinking this is going to be a really long day <laughs> okay this one imagine two drums old rusted no labeling surrounded by new ones clean no spill <laughs> A um, whole can of worms. So, anybody, what do you think they're they're going to ask? What's in the drum? What is it, right? What is it? How long has it been there? Why is it so rusty? Why is it why is it leaking? You know, um, I forgot what this place was, but it, it's a lot of drugs. But yeah, exactly. a lot of times when you see just multiple things hit you at once, you just go, "What is this? What is this? Mm -hmm. Help!" Let's see. A lot of questions, right? No? It's DOT because it's a <laughs> <laughs> it looks like they, somebody just slapped they, it. They, they saw the inspector coming and they just <laughs> <laughs> put a label on it. At least it's labeled, right? Um, and if there's something inside, you know, what is it? How come there's no lid? If there's nothing inside it's labeled, well, maybe it's an empty container. For those of you in the back, it's, it's blank. I don't know if you can tell, but it's, it's a blank label. Okay, this one, this one is a treatment tank, hazardous waste treatment tank, and there's no overhead, there's no canopy, and there's um, half of the lid is open. So in this particular case, the inspector's going to ask, what's going on? How come it's, where's the cover? How come nobody's, where's the person running this place, you know? How come there's no freeboard? There's a lot of issues. How about this one? If you can't. <laughs> Smells it's labeled. Like it's <laughs> it's yeah. sort of labeled. <laughs> 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 
You know, they're going to ask you. You can download it. There's, there's no initials. Who smelled it, you know? <laughs> so, you know, they, they might ask you, it might not be has waste, but they'll ask you, well, is this, is this still something that you're going to be using in your process? If you're not really sure it's acetone, it might be a contaminant. So what are you going to do with it? Are you going to declare hazardous waste? And then last picture, this one's a good one. Anybody can tell us what you think is wrong with this perfect picture? Time's up. It loses no oxidizers. Oh, there's, there's nothing wrong with this picture. Gotcha. <laughs> 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 All right, tip number five. Uh, we think this will save you 60 minutes. Um, believe it or not, coop inspectors don't always have intimate knowledge of every industry and pr process out there. So, with this next tip, we say, Prepare a routine facility tour. So again, you know, uh, we are geographically uh, based. We have you know, geographical territories, not really uh, industry territories. And so maybe in a particular area, we might see a lot of uh, certain types of industries, but we may not. I've never been to a glass manufacturer. I have no idea how that's done. And so, especially for those of you who have complicated um, processes. Again, I know box stores you know, are kind of generic, but if you've got something that you're manufacturing, we probably haven't seen it. If we have, it maybe was once last year. And so we want you to prepare a tour. Have something you know, prepared on hand that you can discuss in the opening conference. Um, if you have a, a map, like a bigger map, not the one that you have to upload to SIRS, because it's tiny, tiny writing, I can't see anything on that. Uh, and usually it doesn't have the information that I want to see. I want to know where you're storing your hazardous material, um, where your product becomes a product, where are you storing your hazardous waste, um, where's your uh, uh, satellite accumulation. So these are the kinds of things that we want to see. And it's helpful if you can pull out a map uh, during the opening, opening conference and let us know, okay, this is where we're going to be going, this is what we do, explain it, you probably are going to have to explain it a couple times, I'm sorry. Um, and, you probably, for the junior yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll have to explain it again out in, out in the, uh, the plant, but the plants can be quite noisy and really a lot of times we can't really hear. So uh, let's see, we can uh, go on. Um, this is probably not a great uh, map here, but you know, just something that you can pull out and you can say, you know, zone one is where our materials come in, zone two fell off the slide, it's not important, probably that's where my paper product is stored, zone three is where the product, you know, or turns into a product. So it gives us a, a visual and uh, again, then you can explain like this is where this equipment is and this machine, you know, puts the head on the screws or something like that. It's, it's very helpful. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. Do you, as inspectors, do you typically print out a copy of the map, site map before you go to it? I do, and I think a lot of us do, but funny, you guys don't always update those either. Sometimes I get on site and I'm turning it around, and I'm turning it around, and we're walking outside and I'm turning around. I'm like, where, wait, your hazardous waste storage is here on your map, but I don't see a fence or, you know, Oh, no, 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 we moved that. We moved that, you know, a year ago. Well, why didn't anybody change the map? So, and then they look at it and they think, oh, who did that map anyway? So, it's usually somebody in corporate or something. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I do try and, and print out the map. I do. But, again, um, the map doesn't always have the detail on it that I'm looking for. And so, it's, it's again, helpful um, if you guys, you know, can print one out and, and choose a tour. A lot of times, they, we'll start. And they'll say, well, where do you want to start? I don't know. I've never been here. Where do you want to start? I don't know. Where do you want to start? And we're just playing this game. So, you know, have something planned. Um, again, you can go to the next one. You know, sometimes the tours or are, are facilities are more complicated. Process, we, you know, process flow is, is always best, but it's probably not always possible. Uh, sometimes we have to go physical layout. That's just the more expedient way of going through the tour. Um, you know, you might have 
uh, something going on at one end of the plant, and then you take your product to the other end of the plant, and then you go back to the other end of the plant. And we don't have to, to follow that process when we're going back and forth. But again, if you can just describe it in the opening conference and let us know what your, your product process flow is and then what the physical layout is and what we'll be doing during the tour, that's extremely helpful to us and saves a lot of time. Which reminds me, again, that I also do some mentoring for high school students. This is about routine facility tour and I would just like to give a prime example of what a planned tour like this can save you a lot, some time for the Coupa inspection. Because I do the mentoring and the very last, uh, our very last meeting is some sort of a planned tour with a sort of a hazmat inspection so that they can see what I do for a living. And these high school seniors are trying to, I'm trying to guide them to environmental health uh, field. So I try to entice them that, hey, this is the, the best job. It is, actually. It's very exciting. Uh, I get to see Rihanna music video, and I get to see Marvel's Agent, of she, uh, Marvel's Agent Carter or something. But I chose a company that would really be attractive to high school seniors. Guess what company that is, ma'am? Your name is? Chris, you see th this, side of the uh, this side of the room is not paid too much attention, so Chris, uh, what, do you what company do you represent, Chris? The, <laughs> the prime example of... <laughs> we missed that. What, what the Walt Disney, Disney <laughs> Company. <laughs> Why is your annual passport increasing <laughs> every year? <laughs> Every year that I... Don't let her leave until we get an answer. Clearly, <laughs> we need to inspect... Who's from Orange County here? Inspect <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> oh, oh, you're not Disneyland. Oh, you are Disneyland. <laughs> and your <laughs> name is? Bob. Bob. I'll give you my business card and we can talk, okay? <laughs> I have two kids. And, you know, and listen, they miss Disneyland. Why? Because I dropped the annual passport. Guess why? You should know why. Anyway, going back to my, <laughs> my story, thank you very much for that segue into a perfect planned tour. Uh, I, I mentor high school students, and since she said it's Disneyland, of course nothing can beat a Disneyland tour. We haven't gone to a Disneyland tour. You know the VIP tour? It's an extra $300? What? What? <laughs> like, and there are four of us, so come on. One anyway, going back. <laughs> Too much, too much in my mind <laughs> going around. And like, anyway, I go to Hawaiian Host Chocolate Factory because the children will definitely be attracted to an environmental health field if they get to inspect a chocolate factory, right? So anyway, anyway this chocolate factory, it's actually in Gardena. Um, and it's a, it's a huge facility, right? But they are so used to, now those people are now, like their ne necks are stiff now. But, but you see, this, this side needs attention because these are Disney people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I will go there, back there later. Anyway, the point is, they already have a set tour for everybody all the time, meaning they know where to go. They know how to do it. They know a designated individual and an assistant so that when we come with our students, and these are high school seniors, some of them are behaving, some of them are not. So you must already know what needs to be done. And I do it every year. And they have like, it's like a, a force of habit already. It's like, this is where we're gonna go first. And then there's an air curtain of some sort, you know, they, they, and then they have a station where, where you have to, uh, put on your hair nets. It looks good on me, you know. But uh, they have a set routine, a set tour, step by step, that you, they don't hesitate anymore on what needs to be done next. And that's what we are alluding to for that tip. So that when a Koopa inspector is already there, you already know where to send him or her. Especially if it's junior inspectors like them. No. Hey, and speaking of junior inspectors, did you see that both of them are standing up and I need a chair? 
So now you can tell who the old and decrepit is. So let's move on. Oh, you know what? Let me add. Uh, also, so there's a lot of box stores here. Um, include in your tour or begin with your tour. Begin with the, the front. If your returns are coming in and you're doing some storage or sorting, you know, at your, your front desk, then let's start there because I need to see that. And, you know, we need to go through some of your aisles, like the automotive aisle and your household detergent aisle. And then we need to move back to where you do your waste sorting. You know, I still need to see some spill kits. So if you've got that. And, um, you know, we want to go in the back. We want to look at where you're doing your sorting and your has waste storage. And we want to see your trash. And mechanical rooms, because there's always some rusted something lurking there and some, you know, oil that's used to maintain your equipment. So just keep in mind that these are the kinds of things that we want to see. If you can have that, you know, on a tour that will definitely save some time. Yeah. What is it in the aisles particularly that you're concerned with? Just the spill kits or? I'm sorry? What is it in the aisles that you're concerned with? Is just okay. spill kits? So uh, we don't regulate retail hazardous materials, right? So the product that you're selling, like the oil and stuff that you're selling to your customers. But once it spills, once the container is uh, deteriorated, it's leaking, it's broken, which happens, then it becomes a waste hazardous waste it's a concern to us and so that's what we're looking for it's pretty much just a walk through you know if there's if it's clean nothing's there you know and I'll, and I'll tell you for some of the box stores you really need to watch your chemical compatibilities you know a, yeah. a home improvement store that has these orange buckets that they you know, anyway. <laughs> you don't have to name the name, not name, name, name <laughs> thank you but you know they have at least they used to have a color-coded system for their, you know, for the waste that they get black for flammable, red for oxidized, or yellow for something else. Completely different from the typical types of hazmat label. You know, yellow for oxidized, red for flammable, black for corrosives. You know, you get some new folks in there that aren't too sure, stuff's gonna blow up. I've been to supermarkets where in the aisles, they'll, they'll store you know, pool oxidizers above the charcoal, you know, next to the lighter fluid. And it may not be so heavily regulated, but you can keep your store from burning down and endangering the emergency responders. And it's, it, though it's not heavily regulated, doesn't mean it doesn't pose a risk. Right. And sometimes, and we'll make recommendations. I mean, just because I can't write it up doesn't mean I'm not going to try and help you out. You know, definitely, if there's anything I can recommend, I'm going to do it. Uh, and, and one other thing, acronyms. Um, this, not so much with box stores, but with plants. Your acronyms, please definitely let us know in the beginning what you're talking about, because you'll throw in an acronym, and then you'll throw in, you'll, you'll call it something else that everybody just on the floor just calls it, and, and then I'm sitting there like, what are you talking about? So let us know, you know, your nicknames and your acronyms for your product, because we just may not know. Okay. Okay, number six. Um, we think this will save you about maybe two hours, and this is something that will help you during your document review. And I'm pretty sure my majority of you guys will have this already. Um, it can serve as a resource, reduce red flags. <coughs> it's pretty straightforward. Just prepare a binder or a resource location sheet. I mean, these binders, in general, if you have a permit for something, just have a binder for that permit and all the documents that's required for that particular permit. It's, it's a way to get organized, um, and it, it, it speeds up, it reduces time for looking for files when it needs to be reviewed. And it, we'll just go through a list of typical files that you might need if you have certain permits. <coughs> if you're a hazmat handler, these are typical documents that you might have, or you might want to put in a binder. I know some of this, uh, most of it will already be in SIRS, but you know, it might be advisable just to print them out the most recent one, have them in a binder. Um, ownership documentation, do you have anything with that? Uh, again, you know, the, the person at the location may not know the actual legal ownership. So especially if you've had an ownership change in the last three years, um, just even jotting down a page that says who the legal ownership is. A lot of times, especially with um, smaller companies, they just know that Joe Smith shows up every day, so he's in charge and he makes all the decisions. And they don't know that it's an actual corporation that owns the company. And so we need to change the permit 
uh, we need to have the right legal owner always. Of course, if you know, you're no longer the owner, think of it on the other end, if you're no longer the owner, you don't want to pay or be responsible for a permit if you don't even own the company anymore. So, you know, you want to put that documentation and, and you want to make it, you know, obvious for somebody. Could you just, like, download all the stuff that you need? If people update SIRS, it's not a problem. That's not always the case. Yeah. I mean, hopefully it's getting better, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's getting a little more strict. The, the, the honeymoon is over, so to speak. So hopefully people will update SIRS regularly. But even now, I walk in and like, oh, no, that ownership changed a year ago. Why doesn't SIRS say that? So. So you did say that you do review SIRS before you go in? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <coughs> now, if we cover HAZMAT in that area, if we have jurisdiction for HAZMAT, we're definitely reviewing SIRS. I happen to cover an area uh, in Los Angeles. Los Angeles, our particular, the fire department only covers has waste. So we don't do hazmat. So I'll kind of look at it, um, uh, not always in a level of detail, but I will kind of review it. No matter what, I'll, I'll review it. So yeah. But yeah, again, the problem, the problem has been that people are just not completely updating it. Yeah, but when you go to a, when you go on site, you look at a particular site in SERS first before you go to the location? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's, yeah, and that's, that's another reason why we're, we're hoping that, you know, these tips help you, you know, with the inspection and help, you know, bring out the comfort level in the employees that are, that are there and they're not waiting for you because we do kind of do a lot of prep to go out to inspect. And so when we get there, we want to do the inspection. You know, we don't want to, you know, hear like, oh, no, we just can't, no one's here. You know, let's not worry about it. If you guys are trained, your employees are trained, it's not a problem. Just let us uh, conduct the inspection because, yeah, we, we try and do a, a fair amount of uh, research. Any more questions? Yes. So I, I just want to be clear. All the stuff that's in SERS, you want it printed out on site as well? Even, let's assume for a moment that SERS is completely updated and accurate. I, I cover sites that I, I mean, I'm at one site, but I cover other sites. So I'm not only on site, but I am the person that updates SERS. So I guess I'm, you want, you want it on, you want a binder on site as well as SERS being updated? So. It's, it's always helpful and sometimes it's required that you have it on site. Well, may I just say first, uh, there could be power failures, right? Uh, and so uh, the computer can crash and things like that. So it can happen that they may not have the level of detail that they want to have when they do the inspection. So it's best that you also have a, a, a hard copy and the binder. And this is, uh, again, th this is not part of regulations or law. These are just guidelines, right? And th this might save you some time. And in the era of going paperless, by the way, I have a class on Thursday on going paperless, so please uh, try and attend. <laughs> but uh, but the, 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 the objective is to cut down the inspection time. So if you have the, the material in a binder and everything is there, then it's easier for them to confirm that what they do is actually they confirm what you wrote in source is actually what's happening. That's what inspection is all about. For example, you say that there's, there's uh, 100 gallons of nitric acid at the plating facility in clean, uh, uh, Edward, Edward, your plating facility, right? Yes, like th that he would say in source 100 gallons of, of nitric acid, right? The inspector will come in and verify that there, are, there is 100 gallons of nitric acid there. So if they don't have a hard copy, if they don't have, uh, if you don't have that binder <coughs> together, then it might be harder if there's a power failure, if there's a computer crash and this and that. So it's easier. I know that there's this era of going paperless, but we're, we're like in a transition mode, so to speak, so still. So it's, I think it is best that you have this binder. And as I said, this is just a guideline.
We're in the transition. We're in transition. Uh, again, go to my class on Thursday, and I will explain more. Uh, everybody, please go to my class. <laughs> Promoting my class. OK, another question right here. Please. It's really more of a comment more than a question. Uh, I think I speak for more than just me in this room when I say that it's a huge challenge for industry to stay on top of this. And I say this with all due respect, but if we're having a hard time keeping SERS updated, what makes you think our binder, if it's there, is going to be updated? So mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, creating duplicate copies of the same document presents as much or more of a challenge for us to manage. And what we're trying to do is make it simple. Mm -hmm. And if we can readily access that information on our computer systems because we have a backup generator that's going to go on in the event of a power outage, then we ought to all come to agreement that that's acceptable. Well, the thing is sometimes, as I said, for example, if it's a big facility, mm -hmm. if it is on your desktop or whatever, and she's walking around, do you have a laptop that can you know, provide us with that also information from SIRS? Meaning, meaning a hard copy you can carry with you, uh, course, the hazmat inventory and everything. That if, if so. you need it, but, and I like the idea of having a routine. I mean, all of that makes a lot of sense, but for in our resource strap environments where we have three people running uh, the production facility, the EH&S person might have 500 re sites that they're responsible for, mm -hmm. and there's just no way for us to be everywhere all the time. We do, however, have 24-hour numbers that we can be reached on, and we will more than gladly walk you through how to get the information you're coming And remember that this is the top 10 reasons, top 10 reasons why you should be here. <laughs> but these are tips, meaning we believe both junior and old and decrepit inspectors agree that if we have the hard copy, for now, if we have the hard copy, it will save us a lot of time. Now, if you don't have the hard copy, then we will spend another, what, 60 minutes trying to access it into, into your computer, asking you to print it out. When we, walk it, when we walk out the facility, we can still do the inspection, but it's going to be longer. So we're we can asking still do you it to the come prepared. We submit the information to you, review it. Well, then in that case, we will have to increase your fees. <laughs> a lot of paper. What, 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 what? I mean, we have to have them laptop. Your opening act because no, it's <laughs> when you laughed. I mean, you know. I mean, no, no, no. Seriously, we we just we just have to deal with what we currently have, and we don't have that uh, capability wherein we have everything with us that we can carry. Okay, we, we are transitioning there. Uh, I guess with the Coupa Forum boards, grants, and things like that, it can happen. But right now, I think also I, I attended the Plating Facility 101, uh, Metal Finishing 101, and they actually suggested binders too, to all their metal finishers, uh, finishing companies. I'm sorry? No, it's his fault. No, 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 no. I'm just saying that even industry is saying it. No, even so industry is saying it. So, and, and meaning it just save some time. But if you don't want to save time, it's okay by us. I mean, let's do it. I mean, because we don't have it. I'm telling you, we don't have it. So if you don't, are not willing to provide it to us, then we will take the time to inspect and make sure that everything is done correctly. And uh, I, I have my boss who wants to make comments. Please.
So in that case, for if, if in that case, if we get invited next year to the Cooper Conference uh, regarding this topic, it will be the top nine reasons because we will, <laughs> we will remove number this one, the binder. Okay. So, but right now, I'm telling you, it will save you time. Okay. Uh, let me take care of that gentleman right there. Isn't it, isn't it a required to update your CERT's information on March 1st of every year? I mean, uh, you said yes. that some people don't have updated information. And that's why we ding him. And so, and then. We issue a notice of violation. Right. And then, so why wouldn't uh, a group inspector download the documents from CERT when he goes to do an inspection? Um, because. First, it, uh, as uh, Riverside, City of Riverside said, it, there's a section of law that it's supposed to be accessible on site, right? The burden of responsibility is on the industry. You are being regulated. We are not being regulated. We are the regulators. <laughs> so, so meaning the, the health and safety code, I don't know the section, do you know? But it should be uh, on site and it should be accessible. And so if it is not accessible, uh, any, if it is accessible through SIRS, uh, sure. But it will take us longer. See what I'm saying? So, but we will do it. We will do it. And then uh, my boss said next year, possibly, uh, help us, Disneyland, give us more <laughs> business. <laughs> business. Uh, speaking of Disneyland, here's my business card. No, actually, I'm serious. <laughs> but uh, don't take it, Bob. Uh, <laughs> oh, he knows you. Stephen knows Bob. All right. Okay. I have to take you to lunch. Anyway. <laughs> I. I should. I wanted to add that um, I to I understand what you're saying. We just, like I said, we don't have internet capability right now, um, and so it's hard. If you know all the places that you have to upload documents on SIRS, mm -hmm. for us to go through and save each one of them to our computer for every site we're going to inspect that week, it would take a long time. We'd that's be in the office point. a long time. That's so that's point. why it, it's helpful. It's helpful. You know, obviously. If you're updated, it's okay. If you can pull it up when we're there, that's fine. Another then, comment. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Gentlemen. I was just going to say, have um, oh. even just a, a note also. I, this is kind of a simple requirement here. For LQGs, obviously, it's a lot more. But just even a note as to where the document can be found is extremely helpful. You know, are you still doing training logs by hand, or are they going in a computer? So let us know. Is it in Bob's office? You know, just let it, you know, just a sheet saying where it is that tells your employees where they are. No, there's a gentleman here with a comment. Just annually, when we do our, our SERS updates, we print them and then we scan it and then we email it to our individual facilities, those managers. Oh, there's a binder that they just put it in. So that every year. What company do you represent, sir? Uh, uh, Bolt House Farms. No. No, seriously, what do you. What? Western Peak. Western. Western Peak Cooling Systems. Peak Cooling? Uh, what do you do? What? We do vacuum cooling and cold storage. Oh, okay. Okay, so Western Free Cooling, they do it. I mean, because as I said, they want to save time on the Cooper inspection. But uh, it is really your choice. These are just top 10 reasons. So, yes, ma'am. Oh, and Stephen, wait, wait. No, I, I think we should. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you very much, Deborah. Uh, I don't have to ask you for your name, but what company do you represent? Disney World? No. I, no. I represent Mission River Products. Mission River Products. Mission River I manage a molding and the tires? Yeah, we make floor mats. We make the oh, floor mats for John Deere tractors. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, John Deere. <laughs> All right, right there. I'm not John Deere. Oh, Mitchell. Oh, Mitchell. Okay, okay. Well, welcome aboard then. But my question is, there's a lot of conflicting information in the hearing, and from what I've been trained, it's not your responsibility to bring to my facility everything that I'm required to do. It's my responsibility to prove to you that I'm doing it. Is, am I on the wrong page? Because I'm hearing no. a lot of... You're not on the wrong page. You're not on the wrong page. You're absolutely right. I, 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 like I said, from the city of Riverside, she confirmed for us that in the health and safety code, your records should be on site or accessible on site for the inspector. It's not like the inspector is required. As I said, you are the regulated community. We are the regulators. So you are being regulated to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And so 
I understand your frustration because you have duplicative efforts, but right now, it is that way. I mean, if you want to save time, it's better to have a binder. If you don't want to save time, go ahead and spend some more time with you, especially if you're Disneyland. I will spend more time with you. All right, Bob is the name, right, Bob? Bob? Joe, I know Bob, and Chris, and the other guy is, do you represent? Paramount Pictures! <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to say, he didn't want to say. Uh, Paramount Pictures, uh, tell me about Starstruck. Oh, okay, we have to talk. <laughs> come, oh, oh, Steven has to come. Uh, to come. And, and look, you know, I, and I'm an evil consultant, so I represent everybody. But look, you know, from a practical standpoint, and not just saving time, this could save you business. I do, you know, in addition to working with businesses, I write hazardous materials area plans for counties and cities for their coordinating hazmat responses. And I will tell you, it is very rare for all your emergency response and inventory information that goes into SERS to get to the guys that actually do the hazmat response. Because it's all in the Coupa office, it's all up in the state computer. You know, so when you when, when somebody calls 911 or you have a hazmat mm -hmm. spill and the first in engine companies show up, really the, 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 the first I, the, the first indication that you have that you have hazardous materials is the plaid smoke coming out of your facility. And they generally do not some jurisdictions, you know, do have it uploaded. But a good chunk of them don't have that information available to the first in engine companies. That delays the response, which makes it much worse for your facility. And even when the hazmat teams show up, there are jurisdictions where they have to get a hold of the Cuba, have the Cuba print it out, and drive it over to the hazmat unit and hand them a hard copy of it. You think you're uploading everything into SERS, you know, and everything's like on 24 where they have all the information readily available. They do not. Yeah. You need to put your information in a SERS. SERS. You, know, you put yeah. it in a SERS. Print out a copy, go get yourself a Knox box, and stick it on the outside fence of your facility. That way, you're not there, you have a hazmat incident. First, an engine company can go to that box, get your inventory, get your business plan, get your emergency contacts. Because again, that first, an engine company, they may only be able to pull up on their computer, on their uh, mobile data units, the business owner who's four states away not the facility emergency court. And we have another comment from the uh, lady at the back. And then that'll be the last, because we got to kind of. Yeah, right. yeah, lady yeah. in the back. How do they replace those issues if there's regulation that you have with Accessible, right? Accessible, right? And that's where, if you have a generator, a backup generator, sure. Sure. As I said, you know, li listen, accessible, right? You have a backup generator, that's good. But then when we walk around your facility and we want to go back, you want us to go back to the office and find out if you have 100 gallons of nitric and then go back out and then find out if there's 100 gallons of chromic acid. And we can do that. I mean, you know, uh, the time is it, the time is yours. Uh, the time is yours. I mean, it's really up to you. So as I said, again, I don't want to be uh, uh, what do you call this argumentative or uh, but but the point is well, well taken. I understand your frustration, but right now it's not there. So if you want to save time, this is what we're trying to say. If you don't, then that's fine with us too. We will fulfill our inspection role no matter what anyway. If we want to get access to the source information at your desktop, we will. And that is required, that is a requirement. Even if it's not a hard copy, it is a requirement of the new SB 1261, then we will go back and forth to the office just to make sure that we're checking everything. Uh, dotting, what, what do you call that? Crossing. Okay, then you, you, you give me your cell phone. I mean, you provide me with a cell phone, right? And then make sure that I can, uh, uh, what do you call this, magnify it and some, something? Sure, sure, I mean, whatever works, whatever works. I, what we're saying is, for us, it seems like the binder works. But for you, the cell phone works. 
uh, and then the battery goes out. So that's the thing. And then we have to charge it. We have to go back to the desktop. And then you have to provide me a free VIP tour at Paramount Pictures. <laughs> Paramount Pictures. I like, actually, I haven't been to Paramount Pictures. Where are you located? <laughs> <laughs> Neighborhood. OK, good. Let's move on. Uh, you know, uh, we, we've uh, yeah. actually beaten this horse to death. OK. So let's move on to the, the next uh, one. Next one. Next uh, one. Uh, there. Uh, the binder, next one. <laughs> Doesn't always yeah. have to be a binder. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> all right. Um, OK, so some people are visual, right? And uh, we think this next, next tip could help you just with training new employees also. We can uh, 60 seconds saved. 16 minutes. Or 60 minutes. Yeah, 60 seconds. Sorry. <laughs> 60 minutes. <laughs> Prepare a hazardous waste flow chart. And that's just, you know, simply just a page letting us know uh, where your hazardous waste uh, is coming from. Uh, just, you know, something that you can pull out in the first, uh, you know, 10 minutes of, of meeting me. And it shows me what you have on site and uh, lets us know that you know what's on site. Also, I think it's helpful in training your employees. They start to visualize. Uh, you know, those materials as something special that requires special attention. You can go to the next slide. So, you know, just we kind of try to come up with just something quick. Uh, retail hazardous waste. Um, obviously, returns and spills are going to generate hazardous waste. Universal waste. Some of the employees think of universal waste. Uh, they realize others don't really realize that that needs to be managed as hazardous waste. They figure, hey, I just throw my light bulb in the trash at home. I don't, you know, they don't, they don't really realize. Uh, maintenance areas also, again, they don't really realize that, you know, if they see a can of paint that's been there for five years and it's rusted, if they, you know, see some used oil that's been sitting in that maintenance area, um, that that needs to be looked at as hazardous waste. And it just lets us know exactly where your uh, waste is being generated. Pharmacy could be thrown up there as well. You can go to the next one. Uh, here's something more complicated. Obviously, anybody who's doing tr uh, tiered permitting, they're, they're treating their waste. They're required to have a flow chart, and that's why we just decided to just carry this over uh, just to a general inspection. This is a little bit more complicated, but it's easy during an opening conference to see where the waste is coming from, what tanks you have, and then we know what we're looking at when we're out there. Okay. Tip number eight. Um, this, is, we'll be, this will be quick. Um, this is something that can help you during the closing conference. And I think for the most part, everybody kind of has this already, but I, I thought we'd, we'd bring it up. Um, it's just to provide a, a uh, an area for closing conference, preferably a quiet one, where you, you can ask the inspector questions, OK, what were you finding? So you can exchange information to be on the same page. <laughs> so make sure that what he saw is what he saw. There was, if there's an explanation for it or something to make it right, that can be communicated. Uh, because it's, you just imagine if you're uh, in a noisy facility like this, can you still hear me? You know, it's a lot of questions, a lot of information can get lost. It's trying to ask what all those, you know, what, what does that equipment do? What size is the tank? Overall, that noise, it's, it's kind of hard. Hmm. Kind of hard. And with your earplugs on, it's going to be difficult. With earplugs on, of course. <coughs> okay, uh, so tip number nine, we figure would save you 30 minutes. And uh, this is something no operator wants to see while the inspector is looking at them. This goes back to the computer. Access denied. A few of the inspectors um, have complained. You can advance it. Uh, a few of the inspectors had complained that um, the, you know, whoever was on site didn't have access to company records. They were either in the computer and they just didn't have, um, just didn't have the code. Uh, so there, you know, it's inevitably whatever, 3 o'clock, 3.01, they're trying to call back east, and it's 6.01, so there's definitely no management, you know, there, and um, they're just trying to get access to some kind of records, and the corporate's back east, so uh, it's helpful if you make sure that your staff has access. Uh, okay, can we go on. Again, doesn't necessarily mean uh, only computer access, but... Those binders sometimes are pretty expensive. SPCC plans, uh, tank assessments, you pay a pretty penny for those, and somebody takes them and they put them in an office and it's locked and no one knows where it is and there's no access. So again, just make sure that whoever's on site has access to uh, those materials. It avoids you know, future emails back and forth and it also avoids having um, uh, to come back for a possible second inspection, which is more time. 
Okay, I think the last one. I think this one we didn't put a time on it because we think if if it won't save you time, it'll save you a few thousand dollars. And this is one of the simplest tips. Uh, a few people still don't do it. A few companies still don't do it. Most companies do. Some don't. I'm kind of surprised some of the chain ones. Some don't do it. Um, but it's, it's very preventable. <coughs> and it's as easy as uh, just securing your trash bins. You know, the most common thing that we observe, is especially in the uh, um, uh, facilities that sell motor oil, people will just buy it do the oil change, uh, fill, up, fill up your car and they'll toss it in the, um, the, the business's trash and it might not be fully empty. And if, if the investigator can't trace, can't trace who it's from, it's gonna be your responsibility. <coughs> so this is very easy. If you just lock your trash, that'll save you thousands of dollars. And the last thing you want to see is uh, an army of uh, Krupa investigators at your facility. When I was, uh in emergency response side of, of our division, I encountered a lot of incidents like this, and it is really sad, but the, the fact of the matter is the property owner is in charge of what goes on on their property. I have seen so many strip malls where in the morning, some of their managers will just uh, look at the uh, trash bin area and they have five gallon buckets of mostly waste oil, all right? But it's okay if it's just containers of waste oil. The problem is sometimes when it's not secure, it spills out. And that's when bigger problems occur because uh, I think I, I, I gave an analogy like this. Uh, if somebody throws eggs on the front door of your house, the, the policeman will, the policeman, like big, chunky, oh, not chunky, hungry. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong word, wrong word. But anyhow, they will come in and investigate who did the crime of vandalism, who threw eggs on your front door, but he will not clean it up. Who will clean it up? The property owner. So it's the same thing with waste motor oil. Our investigation, when, when I was in ER, I, uh, emergency response side of the uh, hazmat division, I do investigations, we find out who did it, if we can, if we can, ease, if we can find out who did it. Like sometimes they will uh, dispose of medical waste, biomedical waste and, and, and other stuff. Uh, sometimes even flammable waste. And then there are some uh, tracking system that we can use, but still, the property owner is in charge of cleaning up the area. And especially when it's <coughs> spilled, it can actually add up to thousands of dollars. So this is just another tip to, to add to your cost savings, okay? Make sure that you secure your trash bin. Walmarts, are, are they secure? Walmarts? I know Paramount Pictures is, and Disneyland, that you are the most secure trash bin. I cannot throw anything there. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, but it's been years since I've been to Disneyland. I wonder why, Bob. Uh, so secure your trash bins. Make sure that you don't let yourself become victims of the crime. <coughs> and as you write your evaluations, we want to make sure that there's additional tips for you guys. So we're going for an 11th one. Get oh. your money's worth. Get your money. Wow. You see, top 10 reasons. Provide inspector parking. <laughs> Advance it. See, now, you guys have to realize, you provide inspector parking, and you see us coming before we've even gotten out of the car. It's an extra label you could put on. Seriously, sometimes. Make the parking way at the other end of the lot. You got two labels, right? Seriously, I mean, it takes, sometimes it takes us time before, you know, to, to even find a parking spot. Not at Walmart, for sure. <laughs> Walmart, I always have a parking spot at Walmart. Paramount Pictures in Disneyland, maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Okay, last one, I there's, think. There's a comment for... Oh, for I wanted to ask you about uh, inspection frequency. Did you establish set frequency for inspection? Every three years. Every three years. Once every three years. That's our state, ma uh, that's a state mandate, <laughs> right, my boss? My yeah. boss, state mandate, once every three years. But Paramount, we will inspect you once a year, okay? Yes. 
Yes. No, actually, what, what my boss said was 25,000 active facilities. We have 50,000 active and inactive facilities. Those inactive facilities can easily become active in just, you know, a blink of an eye. So we have 50,000 facilities and we have like, uh, what, 100,000 program elements that we have to inspect every year. We need more people, and that's why we need to save time too. We need to, <laughs> we need to save time. Are you represent what company? UPS. <laughs> UPS. Oh, UPS. You, you. All right. You were very busy this past season, but I got all my packages on time. Thank you very much, UPS. And the fact that you're here at Coupa means that you're following this tip. So, Attend the congratulations. Any other questions? Thank you very much. For Thank you. Really Thank you. Very good.